Welcome back to the Materials Inside podcast. In this episode, we're taking another look at graphene, but this time we're filming live at the Graphene Engineering Innovation Center. Whether you're listening on our usual podcast directories or you're watching this video, you can find all of the previous episodes and all the previous videos at goodfellow.com forward slash news. For this episode, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Aphrodite Tomu, who will be a familiar name if you've been listening in to our previous episodes. With several degrees and qualifications in material science, Aphrodite's technical knowledge really is second to none. Aphrodite is so much more than a technical expert. She's enthusiastic, personable, and makes really difficult concepts really easy to understand. Aphrodite's passion for graphene will soon become apparent as she expertly navigates through the two interviewees that we have today. Adrian Nixon, Captain Graphene, and the creator of the Nixine Journal, will be joining Aphrodite later to talk about all things graphene. But first up, we have James Baker, who's the director of the Graphene Engineering Innovation Center, where we are today. James is a prominent figure in the world of graphene, and he joins Aphrodite today to explain everything they do here at the University of Manchester. Hi James, it's a great honor for us to be here today inside the Hay Bay and inside this Graphene Engineering and Innovation Center. Thank you very much for having us today here. No, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Uh, could you please tell us about yourself and the gig and the NGI and everything and about the University of Manchester and all your work behind it, what you are aiming for, anything that you would like to talk to us about? Yeah, so I'm James Baker. I'm the chief executive of Graphene at Manchester here at the University of Manchester. So Graphene, you all know the story now. Piece of sticky tape, some graphite, peel many times to isolate a single atomic layer of carbon. Length, breadth, but one atomic layer thick, the thinnest possible material. So what? It got the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010. And a five minute walk from here, we have the National Graphene Institute, where today we have a whole range of science, not just graphene, but over 150 other 2D materials. And in the future, you'll get these stacks of a heterostructure uh, of multifunctional, multi-layered material. But here today, we're in the Graphene Engineering Innovation Center. So this is really my base. Um, so I'm part of the university, but I'm not an academic. My background is industry. I worked for over 25 years in the aerospace defense industry, but the role has very much been around the translation of technology into products and applications. And that's why we're here in the GEEK, the Graphene Engineering Innovation Center, whose role really is to play that critical gap, the valley of death between science, academia, and industry, but to really accelerate the adoption of graphene and 2D materials. You're bridging the gap between, between research and industry as well? Yeah, so we're, we're part of the university, but this building's very much industry focused. We're not doing fundamental research. We're not doing teaching. That takes place in Manchester all around us. We have students, we have PhDs, we have academics doing both the fundamental and some translational research. But the geek is really about that scale up, that translation of that science into that product or application involving 2D materials. Very interesting, very interesting. So can you tell, uh, some, can you tell us some applications that it would be worth mentioning? So graphene, one of the great things, has got so many different applications. Um, in the Geek, we can make 2D materials. Mm -hmm. So we have the ability to both top down and bottom up to make the graphitic or 2D material. But we also can do applications. So composites is one of our key themes. And that's everything from concrete through to polymers, through to carbon fiber. So around the area here in the high bay, we can do carbon fiber, we have autoclaves, we have ovens, we have fridges, we have metal matrices. So by adding a small amount of graphene into a material, we can start to transform the properties. So applications from everything from graphene shoes that I'm wearing today, through to tires, through to lightweight aircraft, through to concrete flooring. So composites is a key theme of what we do. And already you're starting to see on the marketplace products in the market where a small amount of graphene can start to make a big difference. Other areas we're working on include batteries and energy storage. So in particular, new forms of battery or supercapacitor, the ability to do a rapid charge and then recharge many, many times. For me, quite an exciting development 
as we move towards electric vehicles and this drive towards sustainability and net zero. So energy is one of our key themes. Um, we also do coatings and membranes. So from anti-corrosion coatings, through to barrier coatings, through to membranes, where we can take a single membrane or a layered membrane of graphene or graphene oxide to allow certain molecules to pass through, but to block others. So water desalination is the goal there. But in particular, we're looking to scale up to go from making a simple filter into making roll-to-roll -roll coatings or membranes. So again, a key theme of what we do in applications. And then finally, as a key area, we're looking at sensors, RFID devices, smart tags, wearable technology. So lots of different applications from aerospace to energy to automotive, but sustainability is driving a lot of what we do. And then beyond that, we're also working on biomedical applications. So everything from biosensors through to drug new drug delivery, through to treatment of um, brain uh, disease, as an example. Oh, that's very, very interesting. And how can it, graphene can be used in these technologies? Can you just tell us an example of each one, let's say, industry? So if we will take sustainability and lithium-ion batteries, where can you use the graphene? Where it is? So first of all, it sounds easy, but sometimes that's where the science comes in. Uh, the overall challenge we're looking to address here is, if you look in history of your advanced materials, it can take 25, 30 years plus from discovery of a new material into products in the marketplace being used by everyday uh, people. So the real challenge we're addressing, not just on graphene, but on advanced material, is how do we accelerate that whole cycle? Mm -hmm. And the first message, as most of your readers or customers will know, there is no single graphene. Okay. There are many different forms of graphene, both top-down, where you take graphite and you break it down into layers mm -hmm. or few layers of graphene, through to bottom up where we create methane, for example, into a coating of single or few layers onto a substrate like copper or nickel. Mm -hmm. So there are many ways of producing your graphene. There are then many ways of formulating, coating, mixing. So what we really have in the Geek is a facility that's grounded on that fundamental science. So around the Geek, we have a whole range of scientists, engineers, academics, mm -hmm who understand some of the fundamental material science, the physics, the chemistry, the engineering uh, science. But then we complement that through rapid experimentation. So to answer your question on batteries, we want to understand, can we add batteries into the housing, into the anode or the cathode, into the membrane, into the substrate? How do we optimize that? How do we do that in a more engineering manufacturing context? So we'll make a pouch cell, we'll make a coin cell, We'll then test that. If it works, we'll develop it. Or if it fails, let's fail fast, learn and move on. So let's try and reduce that overall lead time of a development for a new battery or a new composite or a new sensor and see if we can do that in a much shorter time scale than it traditionally takes industry to do that. That's a great uh, development that you're doing here, great research as well. And actually you need I think all this combination of engineers, chemists, physicists, everybody can help on that. So one of the things we are trying to build here is the ecosystem or supply chain of companies. We want academia working closely with industry. We want end users who are the end users of a product or application. A good example is Airbus or Highways England, responsible for the road network. We want companies who make graphene, and we want companies who mix that graphene into their product and application. One of the great things about working in graphene is we're working with big companies. Mm -hmm. We're also working with lots of small companies. In the last 10 years in Manchester alone, we've created nearly 50 startups. So that's spin outs or spin ins or mm -hmm. academic researchers or students who have gone on to set up their own business. And what's even more exciting at the moment, some of those startups are into scale up. So we now have a couple of companies who two years ago were one-man businesses. Mm -hmm. They're now up to 20 plus people and they're looking to open a factory here in Manchester to take their product to market. What's also quite Im impressive is a number of those one-man businesses are female. Okay. So quite proud that I think 40% of our technical staff are female engineers. 40%. And if I look at some of our startups, a number of our startups are actually led 
by female CEOs. So I think the graphene and the 2D material, probably driven by sustainability, is also really attracting that diversity of talent, both in terms of male, female, but also cultural. We have um, businesses with people from Pakistan, from India, from Canada. So again, we have quite a multicultural, diverse environment that we're building here around the graphene ecosystem that for me is very exciting. I recently read about nature and about a paper about gold extraction. Could you please tell us about it? So one of the great things around graphene is we have a list of what's called the superlatives. Mm -hmm. People often talk about 200 times stronger than steel, more conductive than copper, yes. perfect membrane. But we also continue to get great papers and great science into nature, into the top journals and publications. Okay. A recent example, Andre Geim, one of the original Nobel laureates, you know, still has a research group here in Manchester, very active, particularly around the National Graphene Institute, interested in commercialization, but his strength is probably more around that science. His latest paper uh, with Chinese colleagues was how do you extract gold from waste electronics? So really it was around how we actually create value from waste and graphene, graphene oxide has a role there to be able to extract more efficiently some of the gold from waste electronics, as an example. So again, it's a piece of science, exactly. but commercially could be of real value if we can scale that up and we can commercialize it in the future. And also assisting net zero. And also making use of waste electronics, rather than going onto a scrap heap and being wasted, can I actually extract the value from that and reuse those rather than mining up new gold. Exactly. So if we could reuse our, our, our rare earth metals, then it would be better than mining and, and getting rid of some of that scarce resource. Very interesting idea, very interesting idea. So I have a question. If the, there is a company, let's say a big one company, like you said Airbus, and they have an issue, I don't know, with an aerospace um, device or instrument that they are making, uh, will they come here and ask the researchers to do something new to develop further their uh, idea or so we've tried to develop a i use the term triage mm -hmm. we have industry you have many problems mm -hmm. sometimes those problems are quite fundamental around the future mm -hmm. so like other universities we can sponsor a phd mm -hmm. we can sponsor a, a piece of work led by a professor in one of our schools across the university mm -hmm. But with The Geek, we've also had a much more challenge-driven philosophy. We want to know those problems that may be short-term. They may want to just, for example, improve the performance of a product. And a good example, again, is sustainability, where people would like to use less plastic, less material, lower energy costs, lower material costs, but also to make their structure more lightweight. So that's where The Geek comes in, where we can work with a company where we can see if by adding graphene we can either improve the performance or increasingly can we get the same performance using less material. The benefit is it's lower cost, it's more sustainable, but it's also lighter weight, so it uses less fuel in, in the environment. So we're much more challenge driven around both short, medium and as well as those long term problems. So again, careful with graphene, it won't solve everything overnight. There's still that development, that engineering, that manufacturing, but we're trying to do that in a much more rapid uh, methodology. Graphene is everywhere, I would say, right? So graphene carbon is in the air, yeah. it's in your body, it's in the ground. So graphene per se is not new, but I think increasingly you're seeing graphene now appear in many products and applications. Again, for me, one thing that's quite important in terms of the evolution of graphene, graphene's 18 years young. Exactly. But it's a teenager, but it's already growing up. And in the early days, you saw products in the marketplace where graphene was in the title. A graphene tennis racket, a graphene golf club, a graphene tyre. Now, increasingly, we're finding products in the marketplace where graphene's in there, but the customer doesn't necessarily talk about it. Or because it's providing competitive advantage, and they don't want to tell all their competition about it. So for me, we're going through this transition now where graphene is really starting to make a performance benefit or improvement and people are starting to really use it in products and applications. I see, very, very interesting. So what do you think will be the future of graphene? Are we going to use it in every single day equipment or? 
So for me, the future is not graphene, but the future is advanced materials. Mm -hmm. So for me, what we're going to have more in the future is almost like a intelligent system where we'll have a requirement and we'll be able to match that requirement to the right material. It might be graphene, it might be an MXene, it might be a boron nitride, a molybdenum disulfide. It might even be this layered of multifunctional material. So in the future, I would argue we'll be able to have a requirement. I want a lighter aircraft that can um, not de-ice um, or, or not ice up, can also have lightning strike protection. I will then design my structure based on that multifunctional material. And it's facilities like the Geek with its experimentation and scale up. It's the modeling, the artificial intelligence, the manufacturing, bringing all that together in a new way, unique way will enable us to do things differently. That's very, very interesting, actually. So do you think that you will have a library or, let, or let's say a knowledge base, I don't know, from materials to do materials that you will say, I have this problem, and then you will find out exactly which material you can use? I think that's the future. That's the future. Um, but increasingly today, yeah, we are called the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre. But for me, one of the most exciting developments here is around MX scenes. MX scenes. So these are more metal-based 2D materials. So again, you're already starting to see a whole world of possibilities mm -hmm. just by being able to scale MX scenes from the gram to the kilo to the ton. That's opening up a whole range of new possibilities. So the learning from graphene is now being applied to other 2D materials. And the knowledge around formulation, coating is also being applied to many other areas. So I often use the term graphenes with an S. So really there's no one single graphene, but there's also this whole knowledge now that's been applied towards advanced materials, which is the excitement for the future. Very, very interesting. Actually, what is an MX scene? Can you please explain to us? I guess we all need to bring Adrian in. So, 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 so MX scenes are just another family of, of 2D materials, metal based, mm -hmm. but again, there's a number of those. Traditionally, though, um, academics have made them by the gram or the milligram. They've been very expensive to buy, but already we're starting to see companies see how they scale that up into the ton quantity that's making that a viable material for new applications and products. So again, not just graphene, this whole family of 2D materials, and being to match those to a particular application is quite key. Very, very interesting. Um, and the, what, the, what other... 2D materials do we have? We have graphene, we have the MXCs, we have molybdenum disulfide. What, what do we have? So I, could, I wish I could list all 150 that are known. For me, I believe there are between five and 10,000 potential okay. 2D materials. So the knowledge of, of sticky tape and on graphene has now been applied to other materials. Unfortunately, many of them are unstable. So they're not naturally occurring. So you can do them in a, in a chamber or in a glove box. But in our sister building in the NGI, they're now starting to develop some of these new heterostructures to make new forms of devices. So again, one of the most exciting uh, heterostructure I've seen in the past is a new form of photovoltaic cell. So maybe you could print onto your tile of your roof a photovoltaic cell to generate energy from sunlight. That would be revolutionary, actually. Be them, but can you scale it? Can you produce that? Exactly. The volume is where the challenges start to come in. But this is what you're trying to develop as well here. So in our NGI, we have the science, but we're increasingly working. So we call it the virtuous cycle. Um, often you have things start in the NGI mm -hmm. and start as a low technology readiness level, low TRL activity. And as that matures, it comes to the geek to see if we can scale it. Okay. Other things start in the geek around the challenge, and yeah. that leads to some science. But increasingly now we're doing work for the NGI and vice versa, where we're getting those cycles sort of closed. So the science is going into application, mm -hmm. and the application knowledge is going into the science nice. to understand that better. It's like emerging technology. So for me, this isn't just about graphene, it's the whole business model of academia and industry working closer together, but driven by engineering and experimentation. Is, is really core to what we're trying to achieve here in Manchester. We often refer it to as the Manchester model. But again, not unique, but I think what is unique is our infrastructure of NGI, the Royce Institute, the Geek, and the broader model of working between industry and academia. In addition to the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre, we have our National Graphene Institute. The NGI is much more focused around that academic research, but in collaboration with industry. So the NGI, that's where it starts. That's where the science starts. That's where the academics do their fundamental research. 
which can then mature here to the geek, or vice versa. Occasionally, we start in the geek, we go back to the NGI. In addition, we have the Royce Materials Institute here in Manchester, which is a collaboration between universities across the UK around the broader advanced materials agenda. So what we have here in Manchester is a science, not only in graphene and 2D materials, but across this whole advanced materials, advanced materials agenda. For me, the really exciting opportunity is combining advanced materials with manufacturing. If we could do advanced materials and manufacturing, academia working with industry to create supply chain, we can create jobs, we can create value, we can really accelerate some of these products to market. James, I think it's a great honor that you discussed with us and about the gig and the NDI and everything and your future projects as well. And thank you for being with us today. It's a great honor for us and thank you for your time. Alongside the 70,000 plus materials that we've got available on our website right now, goodfellow.com is a source of information, knowledge and learning of which Dr. Aphrodite Tomu leads the technical team. If there is anything you'd like to find out about that you can't find on the website, contact the technical team and they'll be happy to help. Hello, Andrian. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. It's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you as well for your invitation and having us here at the Graphene Engineering and Innovation Centre. Yeah, the people call it GEIC or the Geek. Or it's the Geek. The, the Geek is the uh, nickname for the place. It's what everybody here calls it. Uh, it's one of the top facilities in the world, mm -hmm. um, about 60 million pounds of investment, 100 million dollars-ish, and yeah, we're in Graphene Central in Manchester. That's lovely, that's lovely. And a lot of R&D is happening here as well, so... Yes, a lot we can't talk about because uh, exactly. it's secret. But there is a lot that, uh, of development that's taking place in the public domain too, and maybe we can touch on some of that. Excellent. So I would like to, if you could tell us, please, something about yourself. Firstly, let's say uh, what you're doing about Nixon Publishing, anything that you can tell us about yourself, please. Okay, but very quick introduction to me. So I'm Adrian Nixon, editor of the Nixon Journal, which is um, a publication that covers the gra everything developments, commercial, technical developments in the graphing world. We're producing something like this about once every month at the moment. There's so much taking place. But how I got here, um, I am originally an industrial chemist. So I trained with the Royal Society of Chemistry, did my degree through the Royal Society of Chemistry, put on a lab coat, had a proper job like you, <laughs> working in the lab. and. Spent probably about ooh, 13 years in industry, um, inventing things. I did I ran technical service um, with paper making division of a company called Allied Colloids. That's now part of BSF. Oh, BSF. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's more or less part of BSF. <laughs> yes, <these days>. exactly. <laughs> and then. I found that I was really good with customers, so mm -hmm. I ended up being taken out of the lab, put on planes, go around the world. You know, it's like you've done this, <laughs> solve problems in various places. And then in solving customers' problems, we suddenly found that we were inventing things that hadn't been invented before. So that sort of pulled me over towards R&D and then created several patents for the company, some of which are still actually generating revenue for the company years later. Oh, well, that's very interesting. Yeah, it's and it's great fun too. So, uh, like you, I was technical manager for a while mm -hmm. and set my own company up uh, doing strategic consulting for businesses. That was in 2002, so 20 years this year. I've been running my own company, that, the consulting side. And that was briefing boards of directors on technology trends okay. and saying what's going on technology-wise in the world and in the future and why this might be important for various companies to pay attention to and helping boards have the conversations where they could sort of say this is what we want to focus on and we'd help them work out um, uh, exploitation plans. And then one of the things that kept cropping up on the radar of the really big trends was this stuff called graphene, which we might get to talking about. Exactly. And then one thing led to another. I started to get um, contracts to get people uh, briefed about graphene. I also wrote a blog for financial investors for a company called Investor Intel in Canada. And that was briefing the financial community about the developments in graphene. That was back in about 2015. 
And then gradually I was doing more and more of this and we accidentally found that we'd sort of started a, a publishing so company probably... almost by mistake. <laughs> That's the fire, right? Yeah. And, the and now, we're, ever since, what, 2016, so um, well over five years now, uh, every single month we're producing a 50-page document which briefs people on developments in the graphene world. Graphene world, yeah. And exactly. the idea is that we take something complicated, mm -hmm. uh, like a technical paper, research papers. Exactly. And, you know, some of them are not the easiest. No, 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 it's not easy yeah. to read them. Because you've created quite a few yourself. Exactly. And yours would be pretty easy to read, I would imagine, because you're pretty good at communicating. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. I hope so. <laughs> but a lot of people aren't. And so our trick is to be able to understand the paper, cut through the science and explain in plain English what's going on. In plain on. English. Now that you said about it, you're very, very well known, at least in our world, all right, in a research world and uh, in the industry world, that yeah. you can make this, let's say, a very complex thing, very, very easy for somebody to understand, right? Try to, And yes. that's what you're doing with Nixon Publishing as well. Exactly, yes. So can you please tell us a, bit of, a little bit about graphene, what it is, and uh, maybe some applications in a simple way that everybody can understand. Let's say that somebody doesn't know anything about graphene. So, right. so we start off from the basics. Yes, from the basics, please. Okay. First thing is graphene is carbon. <laughs> and carbon can exist in several forms, depending how it's connected together. So if it's connected together in three dimensions, it forms things like soot that you get from a gas fire. Exactly. Uh, or if it's more structured and coherent in a crystal, it'll form diamond. So a diamond is just carbon. Exactly. Um, but also gra uh, carbon uh, can exist in flat sheets. So it looks a little bit like chicken wire. So <laughs> here's some chicken wire, the atomic chicken wire. So the exactly. black dots here, you'll know this very well, are yeah. carbon <laughs> atoms. The white things here, they're bonds. And if you look here, can you see that the structure is flat in that direction and chicken wire in that direction? This occurs naturally in graphite in pencils and it looks a little bit like this so the layers stack up on top of one another so if you can imagine graphite is made of lots of individual layers like this all stuck together and they occur in sort of small uh, pieces called nanoplates and if you think of like um, a deck of cards yes yep. so the stack of the deck of cards is graphite and an individual card within that layer is graphene. Graphene, excellent. Now the interesting thing is that graphene is inside graphite and because it's flat, it was known for quite a long time, probably for about 100 years, wasn't it, that um, it was a two-dimensional material, but nobody thought it could ever be separated out from as, graphite. as graphene from graphite because the scientists were all there were uh, research papers out there proving it would curl up on itself if you tried to isolate it. Uh, oh yeah. Now, the key piece of work was done not very long ago, really, was it? 2004? Yes. When Andre did his work with Costia? Exactly. So two professors at the University it's of Manchester. Manchester. We're on the University yes. of Manchester campus here. And about 300 metres that away. way, <laughs> yeah, there's a research building where Andre and Costia did some experiments and just for fun they thought uh, is it possible to separate the graphene out from graphite so they got a piece of graphite big crystal of it it's probably only about that big and they put it on some sticky tape Excellent. and then they put some more sticky tape on top and then split it and you can imagine now you're cleaving a pack of cards exactly yep. right so then you take one cle cleaved part here put some fresh sticky tape on and keep on doing that. Right. And the average is, um, if you do that about 17 times. 17? Yeah, that, that's what it One takes. seven only. One seven only. Okay, yeah. I thought it would be more, to be honest. Apparently not. And that's what the guys here at The Geek tell me. And if you do that a um, number of times, 17 times, you'll eventually get down to the just one layer left. Layer graphene. So now the guys had an individual layer of graphene stuck on the cellar tape or the sticky tape. That you cannot see it though, right? Well, actually you can because... It 
graphene, abs even though it's one atom thin, thin, it absorbs 2.3% of light, so you oh, can actually see it. You can actually see yeah. it. Yeah. Interesting. So, and they, um, they were able to view under a microscope and use mm -hmm. various polarization contrast methods to uh, show that they probably got a one atom thin layer. Mm -hmm. Then they put it under an electron microscope, which could yes. go down even smaller. And smaller, yeah, of course. And you go to proved, nanometers. Yeah, they proved that they'd actually separated out graphene from graphite. It had never been done before. 2004, and they then prodded and poked it with lots of expensive toys. Uh, you, you and I know what they are. I think Riemann spectrometers. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, electrical testing kit, and they found it has amazing properties. So it is 200 times stronger than steel. Uh, exactly. Uh, conducts electricity better than any other compound. So graphene itself is about 60% more conductive than copper. The co exactly. But if you factor in weight. Because it's so light, it's actually six times better than electrical conductor than copper. It's the best conductor of heat, um, has an incredibly high melting point, over 5,000 degrees C, probably more. Nobody's really sure yet. Yeah, nobody is really Because you can't test it. But this, uh, this stuff will probably sit on the surface of the sun and be fine. And it's also non-toxic, so it's not going to kill oh. us. All right. And the what? latest work coming out of the graphene flagship exactly. and Andre Castro and Netta in Singapore right. this month have just published a paper showing more evidence that there is, uh, there's no toxicity from no graphene. No toxicity for, from graphene. No. no. Well, that's very interesting because I have been in discussions and actually I was at a conference that I was listening to uh, Professor Ferrari oh, and yes. he was yep. saying that there is no toxicity of graphene yep. and he was comparing graphene with multi-wall carbon nanotubes and their toxicity because yep. they are a bit of hazardous, to be honest, at the, the multi-wall carbon nanotubes. Yep. However, graphene is not toxic, so that's no. very, very interesting. You don't want to be breathing in the dust. Of course, but yeah. But that's the same as anything. That's exactly. You breathe in sugar dust or flour dust. Exactly. But, so yeah, graphene isn't going to kill you, that's which is pretty good news. Pretty good news. So it can be used in any application, if you will think about it, even for biosensors, right? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, so, we get talking about the applications, then... There is just a massive, massive amount of work going on. So, Andrea, it would be interesting actually, I think, for the people to know the different forms of graphene because it confuses, I think, sometimes, right, people, and maybe we should discuss about the powder, the CVD graphene. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Please? That's a really smart question because people are getting confused about mm -hmm. graphene. So we know already that graphene can be separated out from graphite, mm -hmm. and we've done that sort of yes. separation stuff. Um, it turns out now people have been working out how to actually manufacture graphene but not using sticky tape because <laughs> it's not very good production method. Exactly. Although it is used for the research lab still for here for the best quality. Um, so if you, graphene exists in two forms depending how it's made. So if you take um, graphene from graphite, mm -hmm. just for simplicity's sake, and if you tear apart the structure of graphite, do you remember those packs of playing cards? There's a number of different ways, aren't there? Because it's called exfoliation, yes. taking apart the layers. Mm -hmm. We end up with um, black powders like this one. So it actually doesn't look very impressive for a black powder, but this exactly. stuff can do amazing things, can't it? it? It can do. And a lot of people are asking me, how does graphene look like? How does it look like? And That is graphene. Exactly. Yes. So that's one form of graphene. And that's where all the commercial activity is at the moment. Um, this particular one was made uh, by a company called Graphene CR, and this is made from biochar. So this oh. is one of the green graphene. Green graphene. And you also know about we have yeah. we have actually in Goodfellow our green graphene as well. But you do. So, yes. Which is made by a, a slightly more sophisticated process. Yes, a slightly we'll more. About that later. Of course. Yeah. So green graphene is a, a new term that's coming out which is graphene that's not made from graphite, mm -hmm. but made by sustainable processes from natural materials. So that's graphene powder. Graphene. That's used as an additive, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yes, please. But then the other type of graphene, which is, as you've said, CVD, which stands for chemical vapor, vapor. deposition. Yes, we can say it in tandem. Yes, we should say that, right? <laughs> and then using abbreviations, to be honest. Oh, goodness, the amount of abbreviations in our exactly. field, yes. <laughs> This is, on here, uh, this is made by a company called Groltex who, yes. you know, in California. And what you're looking at here is a piece of copper foil. 
And on the surface of the copper foil, you have to take my word for it, but I forgot, you know that this is true. There is actually a, a single atomic layer of graphene covering the whole surface. And CVD stands for chemical vapor deposition. And how that works is you get methane gas, mm -hmm. and methane is a carbon atom surrounded by four hydrogens. Right. And that's the stuff that comes out of your gas taps at home. If you try and pull the hydrogens off normally, it's really hard, isn't it? You might be able to get the first one off, but uh, carbon likes to hold on to its hydrogen. And so you have to persuade it to let go of the hydrogen so the carbon can come together. And that's what the copper foil does. So we get this really hot. We have hydrogen gas coming in with a few other things, but um, we take the temperature up to a thousand degrees C. Don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah. Hydrogen, 1,000 degrees C no. is not safe. Not safe, exactly. <laughs> but, the, but the machines, actually there's some machines here in the Geek Antler that can do this. And when the methane comes down to, close to the surface of the copper, the metal acts as a catalyst mm -hmm. and allows the hydrogen to come off and the, copper, uh, the carbon lands on the surface and then covers the surface of the copper. And it, uh, the copper is acting like a dating agency for the carbon atoms, isn't it? Yes. Where the carbon atoms are brought together and they adopt, when they cover the surface, they adopt the lowest energy shape that they can, mm -hmm. which turns out to be the chicken oil graphene. Once the surface of the copper is covered with the graphene, the reaction stops. Then you end up with this one atomic layer of graphene mm. covering the copper on foil. The t on and the top. you can do amazing things with that. And we'll, we can discuss. Show, we can, and, yeah, and discuss so, and show so some no. of the actual results, which people don't get to see normally. Well, that's true. That's true. So, can you tell us a little bit about the applications of graphene and where it can be used? It can be used almost everywhere, right? Yeah. But shall we discuss about some of the applications, please? Ooh, yeah. Where should we begin? Um, so we'll start. We'll start with graphene powder. All right. And this is used as an additive. Exactly. And it, it got a bad name in the early days. I mean, early days, we're still not even 20 years, always <laughs> since it was first exactly. isolated. This was thought to be impossible to exist 18 years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Um, That's amazing, actually. It is. When you if you will think, exactly. It. Yeah. And when the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2010 to mm -hmm. Andre and Costia, who are a Just few there. hundred meters up there, <laughs> then they, lots of investors piled in and people were expecting graphene to come off uh, in the scale of rugs and carpets and to be changing our world immediately. Technology doesn't work like that. Um, we start off with simple things to start off with, which is graphene powders. And when people saw the powders, they went, oh, is that it? <laughs> Everybody was disappointed. Exactly. How can they, we use it, right? How can we use it? So they thought, well, maybe it'd be good in polymers. So we put it, mix it in with plastics. Will it make them stronger? Mm -hmm. And so they took some of this powder and mixed it in with plastics and it made it worse. And so they thought, all oh, right, oh. let's add some more. And it made it Ma even worse. We're worse. <laughs> and loads of people were failing to actually make anything useful out of this. Exactly. And, and it lost credibility. And then... That's true. That's true. Yeah. You remember all this? Yes. You, you yes. And up in exactly. This and then what happened was people suddenly start to realize, actually, rather than adding more to get better, we need to add less. Less. Excellent. And your friend of mine, Debbie Nelson, she, she had a very good way of describing it. Um, she said, it's a bit like adding salt to salt food. Salt to, oh, seasoning the food, seasoning right? Seasoning the food, yeah. <laughs> you put a tiny amount in, the food tastes great. Exactly. If you put a lot in, it's awful. It's awful. It's awful. Exactly That's true. I never thought about that, actually. Well, that was Debbie that came up with that, yeah. And... Clever so, lady. Yeah, she is a very clever lady, yes. Good at communicating. And so this particular graphene, as we said, is made by biochar. This is graphene CR. You can add this to all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And people are learning now to use less rather than more. And so right. we've got things like um, polymer composites, so we can make plastics 30%, 40% stronger. 30% or 40% stronger. Which polymers can you use, for example? Can you use polyethylene? What, which polymers yeah. do you use? Yeah. So this is polyethylene film with graphene in. All right. And very, very interesting. This you might you might think, okay, it's just like plastic. What can this do? <laughs> but this will normally polyethylene doesn't conduct electricity. Exactly. But this will got, this conduct? Yes. 
Yeah, this is electrically conductive. There's enough graphene in there. There's probably around about 2 to 5% in that range. I don't know exactly Very which one this is. But it also makes the film a lot stronger as well. And people are just discovering now that if you put a lot more graphene in, in a clever way, mm -hmm. um, there's a, um, a company called Graphmatech this month. Mm -hmm. They just made a master batch of um, poly polyethylene with graphene in. So that's like... Um, you just get the, the uh, plastic, mix it with graphene, and then sell that on to other people to make things with. That's what a master batch mm. is. Which is. Yes, good. yes. And they're making... We do have master batches as yes, well. they're good making pipes of this material, uh, graphene-enhanced polyethylene, mm -hmm. and it turns out they've reduced the permeability to hydrogen. Oh, exactly. that's very interesting. Hydrogen economy is coming. Exactly. Hydrogen leaks through all sorts of things. And if you put graphene into the plastics for mm -hmm. pipes, you can then move hydrogen around and you've reduced the losses dramatically. Oh, wow. That's just been that, announced this month. Re oh, that, that's the latest, latest announcement as well, yeah, right? Be because I didn't hear about no, it, to be honest. It's going to be in the next issue of the journal. I'm just writing oh, it. Oh, I can't wait to read about it. Yeah. Well, we'll send you the extract. <laughs> Thank you, please. Thank you. So that's, please do so. That's a polyethylene. It's called mm -hmm. thermoplastic because yes. if you get it hot, and exactly, it and melts. it remains, yes. Yeah. And, and then it makes the graphene in, and then when it cools down, it solidifies into a plastic again. So that's one application. One application. Um, very interesting and very useful one. Very useful, yeah, except to get those properties, you have to add a lot of graphene, so provided you oh, don't right. mind your plastic black. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like black colours, to be honest. <laughs> yes, I like dark colours too, yeah. It suits you very much. Thank you. So that's... Um, polymer, mm -hmm. but then one of the biggest applications now um, is graphene in concrete. Oh, can you please tell us about it? Yeah. This graphene in concrete, what, this what is can... This change the world. Is it? This is graphene enhanced concrete. Oh, that's nice. Now, con uh, concrete... It's not so heavier, actually. I thought it would be heavier. Mm. The, the key thing about graphene in concrete that people are going to start hearing about. Mm -hmm. um, it's under the radar at the moment. It's not really being talked about. Here, I'll take that off your hands for a minute. Thank you. <laughs> but concrete is boring stuff for people. Everything is made uh, from concrete. Concrete, exactly. However, mm -hmm. cement manufacturing that goes into concrete accounts for 8% of global CO2 emissions. Oh, that's very interesting as well. A really big deal. So anything really? that can make us use less concrete mm -hmm. for the same strength exactly. is going to be a big deal. It turns out, if you take some of this black powder and you add 0.01% no. on by weight... By weight, yes. That, that's just a tiny, a tiny bit exactly. into concrete before yeah. it's set. It makes the concrete at least 30% stronger. 30% stronger? That tiny amount has that massive Amazing. Effect. And what that means is, let's say it's just 25% to be on the safe All side. Right. Then... Um, this material, if it's 25% stronger, it means you can use a quarter less. So you can make a building okay. which has a quarter less concrete for the same strength. For the same strength, exactly. And that means you could take a quarter off that 8% of global CO2. So you could take 2% of global CO2 off. tomorrow tomorrow worldwide and we don't have to change our it's, lifestyle it's a key solution for sustainability actually in graphene as totally. well totally yeah mm -hmm. and there's cost reduction as well because i think you've seen some cost of cost reductions as well real life trials of this stuff we're seeing on real life projects at the moment 20 mm percent -hmm. cost reduction over 20 percent oh that's amazing just from key a solution for graphene. sustainability and with just a sparkle of graphene right exactly yeah just a sprinkle of this stuff it's amazing amazing so that's they're the big things with graphene powders there's we could talk about space mats, we could talk about space, space habitats. All so right. Sort of yeah. So graphene is used also in the space industry, right? Can uh, you please... Starting to be used. Starting yeah. to be used. All right. So space um, habitats in, in space, like the International Space mm -hmm. Station, they're made of metal alloys. Yes. And you know more about this yeah. because you're an engineer. <laughs> well, yes, yeah. Yeah. and we are helping a lot, I will, I will say, the aerospace as well in Goodfellas. Yeah. So. so we've got things like aerospace quality, aluminium, titanium, yes. things like that. Mm -hmm. These metals uh, weigh quite a lot. And you, to get things up into space, you have to put them on a rocket. And weight is a premium, isn't it, as you yes. well know? Yes, of course. Um, so anything that is strong and lightweight will get the attention of the space industry. Mm -hmm. And there is a company here in the Geek 
we can't go down there because this is secret, but you've met the chief exec, Vivek, yes. Dr. Vivek Concheri. Dr. Vivek, lovely, lovely uh, researcher, actually. Yes, and he'd be a good one to interview later on when he's come out of his secret phase. But what we do know about his work so far is that he's making uh, polymer composites, which are... Uh, carbon fiber materials mixed in with resins and plastics you can add a sprinkle of graphene in and these become strong enough to be used in space and they've got very low permeability resistance to radiation incredibly strong and he's already got designs for the next generation of space stations and oh. that works going on here downstairs oh my, right that, now. that is amazing actually <laughs> That was really, really interesting what you told us about uh, powder, graphene powder and how it can be used and where it can be used. But what about CVD graphene? Okay, so CVD graphene is, just to recap, this material which is the one atom thin layer on copper foil. Mm -hmm. Now, at the moment the technology um, is to make just the one atom thin layer, there, there is the possibility to start stacking the layers upon this. But for the moment, we'll just stay with mm -hmm. one atom thin. The manufacturing process for this has, was first in, developed, I think it was Margaret Dresselhaus in mm -hmm. uh, Harvard, um, about 2010, yes. to maybe, maybe 2009. So th you know, this is just over 10 years old, the technology. But already, um, this particular piece of uh, copper foil here with graphene on was made by Groltex in California, and it was made at 200 mil size, so uh, circular wafers. And you know Jeff Dre, the, uh, yeah. the chief exec, a really nice guy. So we know that graphene can be made on the copper foil. It can also be taken off. Mm -hmm. But also, the manufacturing technology is moving faster than anybody thinks. Already, we've got a company in America called General Graphene. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know yeah, them. yeah, yeah. They've got a roll-to-roll -roll process. Roll exactly. So if you can imagine this copper foil is on a big reel you pull it through a horizontal furnace which is about probably what four meters maybe five meters long and copper foil goes in one end and then graphene coated copper foil comes out the other end and gets reeled up and that can make a hundred thousand square meters a year already on that one production line um, downstairs here in the geek there's another machine which you've seen the extra on new yes that's another roll to roll machine um, that can make about 20,000 square meters a year. Then we've got uh, LG and Charm Graphene. Mm -hmm. LG can now make um, graphene at around about half a kilometer long and speeds of a meter a minute already. Oh. And then Charm Graphene in Korea have got another roll-to-roll -roll machine and they can make a kilometer long piece of graphene, this polycrystalline, um, at two meters a minute. Two, two meters a minute? Yeah. Oh, that's it's amazing. The, the leaps and bounds that this material has been coming on so far. So the problem is we've got graphene on the foil and you can hardly see it here. So what can you yeah. do with it? But you have got some biosensors. I have some biosensors that I would like yeah. to discuss. With. Let's have a look at them. About it. This, this is real technology. So these biosensors are made by a company called Cardia. Cardia. And this has got CVD graphene in here, very tiny pieces. And there's like a, a circular area. And if you can imagine, you've got like a circular electrode around the outside, a ring. And on, on the center, you've got these um, connections which fan yes. out. And you've got 15 different pieces of 15. graphite, separate pieces. That's amazing. In a tiny area there. Exactly. And each one can be functionalized. Uh, we better explain what that is, perhaps. Yes, probably. But e each one can be functionalized to do a different test. So if you take a, a drop of saliva or blood, mm -hmm. drop it onto there, the company here, Cardia, have done the um, microfluidics, which means pulling water through very tiny channels, which you know is not easy. Not easy at all. Water behaves differently at the micro scale, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. But then there are electrical contacts here. So you plug that into a reader, put your drop on there, it can run up to 15 tests simultaneously. Uh, at the moment, these are configured for five sets, three sets of five tests, so okay. doing five repeats. Mm -hmm. But you could do things like diabetes, exactly. you could check for protein markers. These have been configured for doing COVID tests. Co oh, all right. So you could take a sample of uh, oh, your, your saliva, saliva, put it on there, and within 10 seconds it will tell you... And you have your diagnosis, right? More than that. Not only will it tell you you've got COVID, it will tell you you had COVID, 
oh. and recovered. You've got COVID and you are infectious. Okay. You've um, uh, you've had COVID and you've recovered and you're not infectious. And it does about five different levels. Oh, that's it's really interesting. Clever. So the clever thing is, this is CBD graphene inside the chip already in there. Uh, so can you tell us, please, how this works? Sure. Inside here, these tiny pieces of graphene are what are called field effect transistors, mm -hmm. FET. And roughly speaking, how it works is, if you, if you imagine this now is no longer a, a sensor, this is just a, one of those tiny nanoplates of graphene from, made from the CVD graphene on the yes. copper foil. So what we do is we, uh, the, the company can do what's called functionalizing graphene. So it can put special chemical markers onto the surface of the graphene and they're a bit like a hand sticking up, but they have a very specific shape. Mm -hmm. So when a biological molecule comes on, let's say, I don't know, sugar molecule or maybe even a, um, a spike protein from COVID, mm -hmm. the only thing that will dock with that receptor is the spike protein. protein. So they're very, very specific. So if you can imagine, we've got these, this surface covered in these little detecting layers, this functionalization material. Spike protein comes along, lands on there, and it's grabbed it. So what? What happens is you make an electrical, you put an electrical current through this mm -hmm. side and out that side. So you've got current Marine flowing current. through. Now graphene mm -hmm. is a very good conductor for electricity, so the current will just flow through. The trick is you put it on an insulating material called a dielectric and make another connection through here and you have what's called a gate voltage at the back and by adjusting that voltage you can make this graphene just stop conducting electricity for a fraction of a second and the voltage Amazing. ramps down and ramps up again so you've got a very tiny area where it's got very minimal conductivity. With me so far? Yes. Now when the spike protein lands on the mm -hmm. sensor it changes the way the graphene conducts electricity ever so slightly, so now it climbs up either one side or the other, and all of a sudden you get an electrical it's signal a... coming through when you've got the biomarker there. Oh does that make sense? God. Yes, it does. It's so That's interesting, it amazing, and very, very interesting. They are very precise. Very precise, of and course, they should, yes. Which and are two yes. different things, but that's roughly how these things work. Wow. Maybe you should tell us a little bit more about Space Elevator. What, what is it, this committee? What are you doing there? Right, so oh, I'll put these sensors down for a yes. moment. Again, the, um, we come back to this CVD graph mm -hmm. and we already know it's 200 times stronger than steel. So you've got to put 200 times the force in for a, a given weight, a mass of graphene. Uh, we're not talking about just one layer now, we're talking about lots and lots of layers mm -hmm. stacked up on top of one another. There is one application which sounds like science fiction, but actually it's closer to reality than anybody realizes. It's called a space elevator. So how that works is, at the moment, the, the main way of getting up into space is to sit on a rocket, and the rocket basically is a device which throws lots of stuff out one way <laughs> yeah. so, and everything goes the other way. Yes. Uh, Newton's second law, is it? I can't remember. Like yeah. that. Um, but that's roughly how rockets work, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, so you get a lot of shake, rattle and roll and hot stuff with a, as a rocket goes up into space, so it's hot and dangerous um, and glamorous. <laughs> but that is currently the way of getting into space. Mm -hmm. But rockets were invented probably well, it depends who you talk to, but um, most of the rocket work that we're using today was probably about 100 years old. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, about the same time people were working on rockets 100 years ago, they thought about another way of getting into space, um, which was sparked off by looking at the Eiffel Tower. People thought, well, if you can build a tower high enough, eventually you could build a tower that could get into space. But the problem right. is, when you look at material science, and as an engineer, you'll yeah. know this more than most, if you tried to build the Eiffel Tower high enough, the material would just crumple under its exactly. own weight. Exactly, yes. It would, or it would squish into the earth. So that's not quite the way of doing it. Um, in about the 1960s and 70s, there was a chap called Jerome Pearson who worked for NASA, but also Arthur C. Clarke, mm -hmm. the science fiction writer. He'd worked on satellites and he was thinking about geostationary satellites. So we better explain a geostationary satellite yes. first. Yes. So if we launch Thank a satellite you. into orbit All and right. have it 
uh, spinning at the mm -hmm. same speed that the surface of the Earth is turning. Mm -hmm. So it's going faster, but it's always above the same point of, uh, of the ground mm -hmm. as the Earth. So if we launched a geostationary satellite above us right now, then it would be above us all the time, and it would be fixed yes. pretty yes. much forever. And the idea is, if you could take a cable and drop a cable down all the way down from the satellite to the surface of the Earth and tether it on the surface, then you could climb, climb up, up and you'd be in space. That effectively is what the space elevator is. It sounds like science fiction, but really all the physics says that this can be done. It can be done. The only problem is um, that there are some problems making space elevators. So how do you build the, mm -hmm. uh, the station on the ground? And it turns out there's a huge amount of work being done by, about this. Turns out you don't build it on the ground, you build it on the sea. Okay. Because you can move what? the base around. All right, yes. Yep. And that's and, logic, yeah. Yep. And that technology Logical. exists with oil and gas already. So there are platforms, and the, uh, today's technology of build these vast yes. platforms, which are pretty rigid and stable. How do you build um, a big space station mm -hmm. in orbit? Well, we've got the International Space Station, half a million kilograms of material yes. there already. <laughs> yes. So we proved that we can do that bit. And then there is this material that connects the, uh, the, the, the space cable. station. The cable, yeah to the surface of the earth and it has an elevator cage which clamps onto it mm. and pulls I itself see. up. Those, that technology exists now. Exists already, yes. The only thing that doesn't exist is mm -hmm. the material which you make the tether out of. It has to be incredibly strong, strong. and incredibly light. light. Does that ring any bells? I think it does, I think it does, <laughs> that's true, that's true. Now, we're not saying a tether can be made tomorrow, but you are actually looking at some of the early prototype material here that could form the tether. Mm -hmm. So the candidate materials are carbon nanotubes. Yes. They're very strong. The problem is nobody's been able, able to make them long enough. Uh, about, um, typically at the moment, about 140 centimeters. Yes. But the material to make graphene already has to be made at high speed and in very long lengths and very high quality. Hmm. We've already been talking about, about the fact it. we can make graphene now two meters per minute in length of a kilometer already. Now, that's not good enough quality yet to be uh, the material for a space elevator tether, but the pace of technology is moving that within exactly. 10, 20 years this is possible. And as a result of my work on graphene, I've been approached by an organization called the International Space Elevator Consortium, and this is, th these aren't uh, crazy guys. These are proper rocket scientists. <laughs> rocket scientists. They've worked on worked for NASA. They've worked on military space programs. These guys can't talk about a lot of the stuff they've done, but they are the real deal. And uh, back in 2018, as a result of my work on graphene, they contacted me and asked me to join their board. So I'm a member of the board of directors of the International Space Elevator Consortium, oh, which is quite a cool business. Card exactly, to have. cool and fun, right? And we are working on actually taking this stuff, uh, looking at the manufacturing of it, mm -hmm. uh, encouraging people to um, improve the quality, get the metrics sorted. We're writing papers on technical papers on how this material could be made, how it could be put together, what its frictional characteristics are, mm -hmm. uh, electrical characteristics, all sorts of things. And already we're realizing that we've got this multi-layered large area graphene, this CBD stuff. Take it off the copper foil, layer it up, this is going to be a material which is not just going to be useful for space elevators, no, but a uh, material for making buildings, exactly. all sorts. You can have something Sensors, is, as we already discussed. Yeah, something which is thinner than this plastic would stop a bullet if it was made yes. from layers of graphene. Layers of graphene. So that's oh. the thing. Why? Does the graphene has a dipolistic properties? So, yeah. could you please? Um, so, one atom, one atom thin layer of mm -hmm. graphene by itself, a bullet will pass straight through. Yes, but that's what somebody will think about, right? One yeah. atom thing. Also. But as we layer it up, we already mm -hmm. know from graphite at a small scale mm -hmm. that the layers actually lock together. Van der Waals forces stick the graphene layers together. So if you have 12,000 of these layers, that's about 4.2 microns thin, which is about um, as thin as cling film uh, or saran wrap, yes. said in America. And that would actually stop a bullet. Wow. And it would be as light as uh, tissue paper. As tissue paper, exactly. Even lighter than a tissue yeah. paper, right? 
that's just some of the uh, oh, material. We're also working out what the physical properties of this stuff are like. And because we've got perfect atomic layers, we also now know that um, not only that graphene absorbs 2.3% of light, but it also is highly reflective in the electromagnetic spectrum. So down the visible end of the spectrum, we're looking probably around about 20, 30% reflection of light coming on the surface. Mm -hmm. But if you go to longer wavelengths, infrared, terahertz, mm -hmm. microwave, it becomes 90, 100% reflective. So you can make infrared, terahertz mirrors, James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, exactly. You can have something which has very, very lightweight uh, material. At the moment, I happen to use gold and I think beryllium. Which beryllium is being used, yes. With, uh, because that's lightweight and strong. Mm -hmm. But you could replace both the gold and the and beryllium. beryllium with graphene Graph and have an incredibly lightweight, incredibly reflective space mirror, which uh, would be very resistant to damage. Very, very interesting. I didn't know that uh, detail, to be honest. Very, very interesting. Do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I see. That's very, very... Thank you for sharing that. Very, very interesting. I'm very fascinated about that. Imagine that. You can use a space mirror. You can use it for space mirror, even for that. Yep. Very interesting, very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Andrian. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. And don't forget, you can check out all previous Materials Insight episodes by going to www.goodfile.com forward slash news.